Welcome. It's another episode. Who knows what John and I were just talking about off camera. You'll never know. It was mad, crazy stuff. It's another episode of On The Edge with Andrew Gold. That's my name, obviously. It's a thing that I have had since birth. And so we're going to be talking today about Charlie Manson and Scientology and all the weird, crazy links between the two that John has been discovering and talking about on other wonderful channels as well. Uh, John, d- John, tell me again. Okay, I'm not going to make you do this every time you come on the show. So what if you give us one sentence about your history in Scientology? Just one sentence. I spent nine years in Scientology and I enjoyed it. And then I left. And that was 40 years ago this October. That was two sentences. Sorry. Wow. Well, it could have been a semicolon in the middle. Um, and I don't want to keep making John, every time we come on to talk, talk about different topics, I don't want to make John have to talk about uh, his whole story. I'll put a thing on the end screen. You can see John's story uh, back there. So, um, okay, let's also do little intros on who Charlie or Charles Manson was. Um, and I don't think we need to go into Scientology. But not everybody knows about everything, do they? So who was Charles Manson? Uh, Charles Manson um, was... Uh uh, kind of a cult figure he's he represents uh, the death the wilting of flower power if you like that um he and his family as they were known were arrested in december 1969 for a series of murders um starting with a man called gary hinman then a murder of a group of people including the actress Sharon Tate at Roman Polanski, her husband's house. And then the next night they killed a couple called um, uh, Lino and Rosemary Labianca. Uh, they also killed a, a man called Shorty Shay. Um, he's kind of the icon of nastiness. Um, and so much has been... I, I came to this because a mutual friend, Eric Hunley, I was on his show... And I'd done the usual thing, which was Eric said, uh, what do you want to talk about? And I said, anything but Scientology. Um, We spent an hour talking about Scientology. And then after the mic was, you know, after the recording was switched off, he said, oh, by the way, your your late friend, uh, Dr. Jolly West, um, programmed the Manson family. And I was like, what? You know, this guy I'd known uh, programmed the Manson family. And he said, yeah, it's all in this this best-selling book by Tom O'Neill called Chaos. And so I... I'd actually bought a copy of this book when it came out um, and I didn't read it because when I looked in the index, it didn't mention Scientology. And you can't actually talk about Charlie Manson without talking about Scientology. So I went on a show with Eric to to kind of go, look, what Tom O'Neill's saying is the best he's got is that he knows that there was a time when um, Jolly West, Dr. Jolly West was was in the hate ashbury free clinic and there was another time when charles manson was there and that was as close as he ever got them in the two and a half years after that that it took for the tragic events to unfold uh, jolly wasn't a close friend of mine but i met him four times and we spent hours together and i was extraordinarily pleased when his assistant at ucla medical school said jolly keeps two books on his desk one of them is the bible the other is a piece of blue sky <laughs> and through the coming. day he'll sit there and open it randomly and read a paragraph and laugh you know and so just to fill people in a piece of blue sky is john's quite brilliant book about cult dynamics and scientology in particular um t- tell us quickly about J- jolly west like who, who is he just people never heard that name who's jolly west Johnny West was a, a psychiatrist. He was the head of um, neuropsychiatry, I think it was, and biobehavior at UCLA Med School. Um, he was, he's famous for various reasons. Uh, he killed an elephant with LSD, an elephant called Tusco. He didn't mean to. He didn't realize that, that elephants don't like LSD. Um, no. And he was very sorry afterwards, especially as he had to pay for the cost of the elephant, you know. Um, and it, it would appear, and, and Tom O'Neill, I think, does have a reasonable argument to say it was a front group from the CIA that paid for the el- dead elephant. So there you go. Um, he was a notable researcher into drugs. And the reason he comes into the Manson story is that in 1967, he ran a crash pad in Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, the centre of the Summer of Love, and invited hippies who were tripping on LSD to come in and sit down while his graduate students made little notes about them and funny comments. Um, 
that's as close as far as I can tell as he got to Manson. Um, he happened to be in that part of the world briefly. But uh, he gave us the term demotivation to explain what happens if you smoke too much dope every day. Um, and very curiously, oh, back in, I think it was 91, Steve Hassan and I had lunch in LA with Jolly West. And, and Steve said to him, um, what drugs were the Manson family using? Because he was a world leading expert on drugs, not having taken them, but having studied them. And he, he immediately went Jimson weed. And this led me into, um, yeah, the other part of my, you know, one part of my problem is that Scientology is not being mentioned in terms of Manson. And Manson spent 14 months studying Scientology. He had 150 hours of Scientology processing. He read Hubbard books. And this information comes from Manson's autobiography. So he talks about it but also from internal documents that were seized by the FBI in the largest raid in their history, which was on Scientology in 1977. Now, I thought these documents were known. I, In fact, in a piece of Blue Sky in 1990, I wrote, Charles Manson had 150 hours of auditing and nobody made any noise about it or got upset about it. Um, because I've got these documents, which are internal reports to Ron Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue Hubbard, who was the controller of Scientology's Guardian's office. And a month before the Manson trial started, which was July 1970, on the 22nd of June, a long report is sent to Mary Sue Hubbard saying, whoops, Manson did Scientology. We've got to keep this from the press. What's more, three other members of the family did Scientology. And Tom O'Neill doesn't mention Scientology at all in a book that took 20 years to research and write, and is called A Masterpiece by the Times Literary Supplement. Why do you think that is? I don't think he understood its relevance. I, uh, Jeff, Jeff Gwynn wrote a book about Manson, and, and they're both very well-researched books. I just don't agree with O'Neill's conclusions about my friend Jolly West, you know, uh, who he's basically, he says at one point, you know, uh, he's my great white whale. And that makes Tom O'Neill Captain Ahab. And Captain Ahab was a little bit obsessed and um, not very friendly towards whales either. And, and that's not popular anymore. So, um, But Jeff Gwynn knows about the Scientology, mentions the Scientology, but then says it was because he did Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People course that, that he knew how to control people. So looking in his bibliography, I'm like, well, what did he read about Scientology? And he read um, What is Scientology, which is a big fat book that's handed out to promote Scientology as a belief system, as a faith, as a religion, which doesn't show you that Scientology teaches well, 2,000 techniques of control, 2,000 ways of controlling people. And it's quite open about it. Hubbard talks about having infinite control, having the intention to control people. And their whole thing about their upper levels, the operating Thetan levels, is that you will be able to intend things to happen. You know, you'll have magical powers. And so that's where I started from. Since then, I've read Tex Watson's book. He was led the murders at the Tate and uh, La Bianca houses. Um, I've read um, Gwyn's book. I've read reread Manson's book. Um I'm just finishing this one, which is, oh, here we go. Member of the family, Diane Lake. Member of the family. Yeah, she was 14 years old when Manson recruited her. And her own parents had basically said this was fine because they'd become hippies. And, you know, she, you know, is, is cast adrift into this, what at first is a peace and love cult. You know, you've got to destroy your ego and love everybody. And eventually is is a... Yeah, murder and mayhem group she was not involved in any of the killings but she was a witness for many years during the various trials that eventuated by reading these books and looking at uh, susan atkins and lynette Fromm's books also members of the family it to somebody who has studied scientology it's very obvious just how much charles manson was was using the techniques of scientology so if we start with the famous Manson stare, 
Yes, he did training routine zero. How to stare at people, how to confront people, how to get locked on eye contact with people. So that thing, which is almost the first thing that people think of with Manson, that, you know, staring people down came from there. And he himself says that, you know, basically he was five foot seven. Uh, he was scrawny. He was in prison for pimping and he'd spent most of, you know, from the age of 12, he was either in reform schools or prison most of the time. And he, you know, must have had a terrifying existence because he was beaten up. He was in prison. And Scientology, he talks about the transformation in his life through Scientology, that he now knew how to lead. He now knew how to take charge of people. So whether it's the most relevant thing, it's certainly incredibly relevant that, that he was you know, engaging in these things. He later on will use Scientology words. So um, in Diane Lake's book, she suddenly starts talking about him teaching them about postulates. And this is a, only Scientology uses the word in, in, in the way to mean basically a wish, a demand of the world that it should comply. She, use, she uses that word nearly 20 times in her book. So it, to her is very significant. Tex, Man, uh, Tex Watson talks about, uh, and, he, and this one I'm having difficulty with, he talks about Charlie Manson saying they had, all had to be deprogrammed. I have difficulty with it because I don't think the word was in the language in 1968, 69. Um, first use I can find is 1973. So I think Tex Watson, but the basic idea that he was saying, you're all hypnotized and I'm going to dehypnotize you, that's a fundamental idea of Scientology. And when people say that, you need to be a little bit cautious, I think. Saving the reactive mind. Just as an aside, I was talking to, um, well, I was talking last night, I was doing a stream about um, Ian Watkins, who is the, um, the the singer from The Lost Prophets, who did terrible, terrible things. I have to be careful about what I say exactly on, on YouTube, but terrible things to children. Um, and he was able to get women to not only offer up their own, but they were planning to have another for him to have his way with. And it reminded me of Manson a bit because, and then I said it was quite cultish. And then people who were watching were saying, oh, that's not, well, that's, what's that, a cult? That's not a cult. But would you say that is sort of cultish? And is that the same sort of, how you get these people, as Manson did, to go and kill for you? How does that happen? It's the essence of what a cult is. A cult is, by definition, a, the a group that reveres a particular leader or doctrine. So if you're obedient to somebody, then you're in a cultic relationship, you know, whether it calls itself a religion, a psychotherapy, or, or, or just a partnership, that is a cultic relationship. What I'm working on at the moment, I'm working on a book proposal for a, a book about belief. And Manson will be a big fat chapter in there because Looking at what's been said, I can show step by step exactly how his followers were indoctrinated, exactly what he did within the purview of somebody who has studied authoritarian groups for 40 years. And of course, that makes me, yeah, I have a very different perspective to a journalist about that. And so there have been some excellent journalists, Tom O'Neill, Jeff Gwynn, they're really good at what they do. But to understand what they're looking at, you need a specialized knowledge. And um, Manson pulls together the tricks that he'd learned as a pimp, which, of course, are ways of controlling, um, in his case, the women. So he learned how to recruit women. And it's very simple. He used love bombing. He would find a relatively plain looking girl and go up to her and say, you are so beautiful. And I'd like to say, Andrew, that you too are very beautiful. What can I just, I'm in awe of your beauty, Andrew. Are you being Charles or John? <laughs> we'll never know. And uh, I'm, if no. you're not careful, I'm going to tell everybody you were drinking chocolate milk before we came on, you know. And that's your secret. <laughs> it's, a, it's protein, it's protein chocolate uh, stuff with banana just, in it. Justifications, you know. I, terrible debauch i'm still concerned because I, I asked you if i've got any chocolate in my mouth and you said no but i can only see a small screen of myself so yeah. it's very possible that afterwards people will be going has he got sort of chocolate around chocolate? his mouth so if that is the case i'm yeah. glad you brought it up yeah absolutely so that's your excuse 
but but yeah, yeah anybody who is is bringing people to act against their best interests that's a cultic relationship plain and simple um it's not necessarily a cult but what are some of the things and so love bombing's one of them what are some of the things he was using on these women charles manson was using on these women that are straight from the scientology playbook aside from this so we've got the stare there's there's love bombing of course which is typical of, of many cults what is, that, is there anything else quite specific like that yeah um several people talk about him changing hats and, and he, that's the expression he used now what they mean by this is that he could switch a uh, personae he he could offer up a completely different person in a, a in a moment. Now, this would come from what's called tone scale drilling in in Scientology, where you learn to mimic emotions, um, so that you can control other people emotionally, so that you can make them feel better or you can make them feel worse. And I must say, I never took to the idea of making people feel worse. That seemed wrong to me, so I didn't do it. But that it, it's a technique that's used to recruit people that, that you make them feel worse and worse about themselves, you know, their fear of worsening, and bring them to do something. The changing hats, the term hat, was used by Hubbard to mean superficially a job, but more deeply a personality, uh, a beingness, as he called it. He liked adding ness to the end of things. Um, for some reason he loved making words up two 600 page dictionaries full of nonsense um but so we have him you again using the, the the term hat but that he would switch personalities according to who he was talking to and of course you know he he had a fairly he, he hung out with some pretty ce celebrated people dennis wilson the drummer with the beach boys the beach boys recorded a charles manson song and Charles Manson was very upset because they changed the lyrics and the title. The song was originally called Cease to Exist. Um, he also hung out with Terry Melcher, perhaps not a well-known name anymore, but he was um, Doris Day's son, the major film star of the 40s and 50s. And he was one of the most wanted uh, producers, record producers, because he'd produced Mr. Tambourine Man for The Birds. And apparently told four of them that they couldn't play on it because they were rubbish. So he put session men in. Sorry about that. If David Crosby is watching this, it's nothing personal. But Roger Gwynn was, McGuinn was the only person who could actually play, according to Melcher. Terry Melcher, his girlfriend... I, I always thought that was... I thought it was Bob Dylan. Oh, he wrote it, but there was a huge... The huge international hit was The Birds. And that's the... Instead of, hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, you, you've got a bloke who can sing. Um <laughs> Terry, it's not that funny. Yeah. Stop it. Um, t t I thought it was really accurate. I, nothing tickles me like uh, impersonations when they're quite good. I, I, it's my one thing I wish I could do, and I can't. And oh. I love when people get them just right. There you go. Well, uh, years of practice on yeah. that one, of course. Um, <laughs> Terry Melcher lived with Candice Bergen, the film star. Yeah. And one yeah. of the recruits of the family was the, the daughter of Angela Lansbury um very briefly thankfully but so he was hanging out with the hollywood set and and doing all of that in terms of other techniques there's a specific technique that we know he did in prison because when scientology investigated they found the guy who had done all of this stuff with him over 14 months a man called lania rama and he was in prison according to scientology's account he was in prison because he'd failed to rob a bank and the reason he tried to rob a bank was to get enough money to do Scientology. <laughs> wow. There you go. Criminal activity. They didn't make him do it. I don't want anybody seeing me. You know, not really. I've yeah. had enough of that. Um, but one of the techniques that, that he did is, is called space hand mimicry. And it's part of a set of techniques which are called the control communication havingness processes. And I'm falling asleep at this already myself. And that's part of the objective as opposed to subjective processes. Now, what you do with space hand mimicry, and Manson did this to the people around him all the time, to his followers. You put your hand up or both hands, and then the person is meant to follow the movement of your hands. And which seems simple enough until you go and talk to a hypnotist about it. And they say, oh, that's called pacing. 
You know, there are other ways of doing it, like following somebody's breathing or following their gestures. Um, in the Dead Poets Society, Robin Williams has the kids walk around the quadrangle and they fall into lockstep. And that's what he's trying to show them, that people will naturally pace. They will come under control physically and psychologically by mimicry. So uh, repetition, fixation and mimicry. That's that's my shorthand for anybody watching. That those are three ways of getting people into um, states where they can be more easily controlled and where they will often feel euphoric. Um, states called trans states by some people. Um, so ontology uses all of them. Um, repetition, fixation, mimicry. So the mimicry technique was something he did. And he then added to this by giving people... They'd have weekly LSD sessions, which usually turned into sexual orgies, where Manson would tell people who they were going to have sex with. And um, lesbian sex was all right, but no male homosexuality, because he pointed out that that had been done to him from the age of 12 onwards in school and in prison, and he wasn't keen on it. Um, but... And they, you know, in the family, you have a ratio of generally of five women per man. So uh, there was a certain amount of lesbian sex involved. Um, and this control, this kind of, we, he gives them LSD and does this. And again, O'Neill goes for, for this aspect and says they were programmed with LSD. Well, frankly, reading about it, most of them had taken LSD before they met Manson. It was everywhere in 1967 uh even the 14 year old diane lake had taken lsd before joining manson given to her by her father i think that's probably a little bit young personally but um so they come knowing what this drug does and then you're going hang on a minute we've not had a mention of scientology where's the deterrer where's this other drug which both manson and tex watson admit was being used and they both call it talache tea and i looked that up on the internet and they're the only two people who who've ever heard of talache tea but because jolly west had told me 30 years ago that it was jimson weed i went and looked it up and i already knew about deterra this drug um because i'd read about it when i was a teenager um the a thing called the British India Hemp Drugs Commission, which was the largest survey of drug users, I believe, to this day, possibly 10,000 people, because somebody had suggested that cannabis drives people mad. And so there was this huge eight volume report and they said, no, it doesn't. Cannabis is absolutely fine. So that was the point of view of the colonialists and the Raj at that time. But they also said alcohol should remain illegal in India for the native population, not, of course, for the soldiers looking after them. Um, but Datura should be extirpated. And I'd never seen the word extir. I was about 17. I'd never seen the word extirpated. So I looked it up and it went pulled up by the roots. So Datura was listed as an incredibly dangerous thing. I remembered that I'd met this ethnobotanist 30 years ago. I met this wonderful man and I got his email address because we still have a friend in common. Um, and I wrote to him and he, gorgeous man, he wrote straight back and he said, yep, that's Tala Oche tea. And yes, it's Datura. And it is the very definition of a bad trip. And looking it up online, you've got psychedelics psilocybin lsd mescaline and they have a certain effect they um disorder your perception of the world around you but what you see is based upon what's around you you know the the rug rug has letters in it that are moving around then there's a class of drugs called delirians and i believe ayahuasca and ibogaine would be in this class but the nastiest of them all is detura Tex Watson says that the first time he took it, which was, I think, the April of 69, so three or four months before the murders, it lasted for 10 days. He didn't know how he'd got from Spahn's movie ranch in the Siamese Desert, where they were, 
30 miles away to Van Nuys. He had no recollection of that. He was picked up by the cops, crawling on his hands and knees among a group of school children, going, beep, 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 beep. 10 days tripping. And not with the world around you sort of melting and changing a little bit, but you're in the nightmare you know um probably from the descriptions i've heard like k-holing on ketamine which is an experience that lasts a few minutes but extend that to 10 days you've got no idea what's going on and manson in fact says that he never saw tex watson away from the influence of of datura so the idea that this is the terrible thing that lsd did or was done doesn't really ring true he was also in against Manson's orders. He was also taking amphetamines. So, you know, by the time he gets to do the commit the horrific crimes, which I'm not going to get into any details of, um, he's he's out on LSD, amphetamines, and Datura. And I think we need to take that into account. That there's the programming that that Manson is inflicting upon them. But they're also contributing to it themselves. What is clear from all of the accounts is that Manson didn't take Datura and he didn't ask his followers to take it. So this is the random thing that's thrown into the mix. Is that you could also suggest though potential maybe it's speculating, but he, he went after vulnerable people. Uh you spoke about one one woman whose whose parent was giving them hallucinogenics. Uh, and this guy's obviously got a problem. I mean, isn't that part of being a cult leader, sort of finding and targeting people who are already quite vulnerable? It, it's a question of what vulnerability is, that, that there is this common belief that, that cult members are weak, ineffectual, unintelligent, easily um, controlled. But in fact, at the other end of the scale, a lot of cult members are very intelligent. I can't obviously count myself among such people but no um god forbid but also very determined also very capable if you know thinking about somebody like my fi friend mike rinder who had you know like 30 years of in scientology you he is a very competent human being he is smart he's very capable of doing things so vulnerability is not necessarily a negative vulnerability it's not necessarily a weakness one vulnerability a major vulnerability is um changing where you live if you move to a new place uh starting a new job meeting a new group of people these are all steve hassan was had his he was just broken up with by his girlfriend i think when he joined the moonies that's exactly right and three lovely young, young women invited him to dinner i wonder why he went yeah <laughs> yeah no idea <laughs> Gosh, but but that's it, isn't it? But that's vulnerability still, isn't it? I agree with you. It, that it doesn't mean positive or negative. It's just yeah, a sudden change in your life or something. But these particular Manson ones you speak of, they sound like they were vulnerable in a very uh, maybe since childhood. I think it's specific. Looking at the the core individuals, um, Tex Watson was was an all American boy. He he was uh, an athlete. Uh, he'd done very well in school. Uh, there's nothing in his background to suggest problems. He then had a good job and earned good money. And he twice left the Manson family uh, the second time for three months, but was pulled back by something that, that appealed to him. And I think you know, one of the other reasons that people join, join cults is that they look at the world, see how corrupt it is, and really want to do something about it. And somebody comes along and says, we know how to change the world. And... You know, they find themselves following Adolf Hitler or, you know, L. Ron Hubbard or somebody. And, I mean, there's another thing I think is very important about recruitment, and that is that we all have our own habits and routines. And if you can disorganize somebody's habits, then you can give them new ones. You know, this is the idea of unfreezing, changing and refreezing, which is the simplest view of thought reform, Edgar Schein's view. And... There are particular points of vulnerability as well. The teens, and when you get to around my age, these are the most vulnerable times. So don't try anything on me. Um, I haven't got any money, Andrew. Um, but so in your teens, you learn infatuation, this, this surge of emotional connection to the world that you, you probably didn't have as an infant. And you become more vulnerable to 
agents of infatuation things that so the prime recruiting periods are the first term of college you've gone away from home you're in a new environment you've got new people around you that's why so many campuses prohibit um cult groups on on the campus but the point is that you know as with the moon is they've got two thousand different names <laughs> they'll just invent a new one and come along and say hi would you like to come away for three days you look fantastic andrew you look great you've got no chocolate milk on your face at all you know and away you'll go <laughs> thinking they'll probably give me some chocolate yeah. milk you know and it might be have a banana or something really nice so, so you're more vulnerable at that at that age in your teens things settle down with adolescence then in your upper 60s and your 70s you'll become more vulnerable again because certain functions of the brain certainly in my case are, are no longer functioning um and so you get people like the larouches followers of lyndon larouche the right-wing um political demagogue and they they look to obituary columns and find somebody who, who's been widowed or widowed and oh, that's awful. knock on their door and then uh, they do things like you know can i go to the bathroom and they look in your bathroom cabinet to find out what medicines you're taking so they can come down and tell you mysteriously uh what conditions you suffer from because they they know it i think the the great steve martin deborah winger movie leap of faith shows a lot of the tricks everybody should watch that one it's that's about christian evangelists also a big fan of the righteous gemstones let's throw a plug in for that so here's a question i often ask about tom cruise and john travolta of course um would charles manson was he a true believer of something whether it be scientology or some sort of belief in himself or whatever it may be or was he a psychopath who's going okay i'm going to employ all of these rules to get people to follow me and do my bidding I think every case I've looked at, and obviously Ron Hubbard in, in more depth than any other, in more depth than anybody in their right mind should, every case I've looked at brings me back to what Martin Gardner, um, incredible critic of, of cult groups, author of, of wonderful books, he said you can be both a crank and a charlatan. And I think that with Manson and with Hubbard, that their self-belief that a part of the problem was that they did not believe themselves. They knew they were bad people and they knew that they were working a scam, but they also did believe in what they were doing. So Hubbard at the very end, um, the guy who was with him called Serge Fouth, who reported in Lawrence Wright's very good book, Going Clear. Serge Fouth, Hubbard turned to him and said, I want you to make me a, an electrometer the device lie detector used in Scientology that will kill me I have failed completely I have not achieved anything and I heard I interviewed people the earliest was a woman who was with him in 1950 who was his girlfriend Barbara Cloden um, but then over the years I interviewed people who were with him at different times and they'd all got this story that in private he would collapse and he'd say I'm a failure um, there are stories of his wife, Mary Sue Hubbard, having furious rows with him when they were on board ship in, in the Mediterranean, saying, you're a charlatan, you're a fraud. His own wife, who you know, helped him maintain the whole thing and went to prison so that he wouldn't have to. So I think Manson, I think Manson believed what he was, what he was teaching. And what he was teaching, again, there's, there doesn't seem to be any simple statement of this in the literature. But so his basic idea was this thing helter skelter that the the blacks would rise up, defeat the black the white oppressors, and meanwhile Charlie Manson and the family would have found what he called the bottomless pit, and apparently none of his followers knew that this is a reference to hell. <laughs> it's like they weren't sufficiently educated. And the bottomless pit would be in Death Valley and it'd be kind of underground, but there'd be enough light coming in that 12 types of tree would grow, each with a different... This is all true. Each with a different kind of fruit for each month, and they wouldn't have to toil anymore, and uh, they could consider the lilies of the field if they wanted to. Um, they would be fine, and then eventually the blacks would realise, get this, that they weren't smart enough to rule the world, and they'd come begging for Charlie Manson to become king. 
and you kind of no, they they didn't believe that really one of the things and so you've got scientology dale carnegie the book of revelation revelation of saint john the divine and the white album by the beagles <laughs> and not one member of the family knew what a helter skelter is they just took it on as this this is this weird expression that means a war between the races and kind of going no it's a fairground attraction <laughs> it's a slide <laughs> You know, I'm coming down fast, you know, on a coir mat. It, you know, oh, dear, Paul, Paul McCartney, what did you do there? It's nice when he screams like that, McCartney. He's got that great screaming voice like an O'Darling. Oh He's incredible. I, I sat with um, Mark Dean, who was the record producer who signed Wham! and ABC and Five Star and, and lots of things. I hung out with him for a while because he got involved with Scientology. And we're in a in a bar with some guy who he said was the manager of the stone roses i don't know if it was a road manager or a manager but and um this guy says oh john lennon great rock and roll voice and i said paul mccartney great rock and roll voice and they were like no no and he sort of go go and listen to i'm down and and tell me if john lennon could do that you know it's a brilliant man john lennon but paul mccartney was out in the wilderness for me because of wings and and all of the nonsense for many years and then about five years ago i list you know i saw i think it was the album's called next and just went this guy is a genius there's a youtube where you've got the four different timbres of human voice and the then the range of the human voice the six octaves and he demonstrates that mccartney sings every one of them he has the the most you know incredibly variable voice so good for him you know we, we will forget mull of, mull of kintyre yes uh, that horrible song but but so was the song that was i don't know you know i i always end up when i'm talking to you getting dates and references utterly wrong because i was born in 89 and i do know about some things that happened before but not everything no Paul bother. mccartney's sort of the beatles song helter skelter is that before has Manson taken it from that? Yes. The 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 song okay. is on the white what's called the White Album. It's actually its actual title is The Beatles. And and it's a fantastic album. There's a wonderful remaster of it by George Martin's son Giles Martin, which, you know, usually remasters are like, what have I just paid money for? But in this case, you actually can hear that he's rebalanced things. And he did the same with Abbey Road and Revolver. Uh, really splendid. But the Beatles, having done the, these incredibly, you know, complicated things on Magical Mystery Tour and, and um, Sergeant Pepper, you know, where the, the Calliope on For the Benefit of Mr. Kite, they took something like 30 different recordings of Calliopes, cut them in as tape into two second things and then put them all together to give this weird sound but everything on there was so and they just went we just want to record an album as a band just the four of us so the white album is almost a live beatles album and a bunch of the songs it comes out in 68 and and manson's crazy for it you know it's like uh, blackbird that's a song about the coming revolution of black people take these broken wings and learn to fly uh anything you like he's he's found some interpretation of it and he believed also that the beatles were addressing the album to him they knew that the man's son the son of man the second coming of jesus had arrived and they were looking for him they knew he was in america because they'd written a song called sexy sadie and one of his followers was called Sadie. So it's actually about okay. Mahesh, the, the so-called Maharishi, um, and their feelings about him. Honey Pie, which is a song about um, somebody being in love with somebody who's gone from Lancashire to, to the US to become a, a film star, and, and this guy's wanting her to come home. This is, it says, cross the Atlantic. This means the Beatles are going to cross the Atlantic so they can meet Charlie Manson. You're making me crazy. That's about him as well, presumably. Did he was he aware he was crazy and that was referencing him? <sighs> crazy Charlie. Bloody hell! So he must have been d delusional as well. So we're talking about potentially psychopathic, delusional. I'm doing all the um, diagnosing. Yeah, let's diagnose him from our expert Psy background. Psychiatric chair. I think DSM five would probably have said that. <laughs> yeah, uh, he was. He 
He's that strange mixture that you often find with cult leaders that people look at them and call them geniuses. They think they're really smart, but they aren't. They're, they're cunning. They're very good at reading other people and seeing how they feel and how they respond and then changing hats, then, you know, becoming the personality that will appeal to that. Um, you know, Hubbard was not a deeply educated man. Uh, having studied his life, he read a load of Pulp Fiction, cheap manuals on hypnosis and whatever he could get about magic and Alistair Crowley. Um, that there's no deep study involved. He doesn't know any philosophy. Everything that he says about philosophy comes from Will Durant's story of philosophy from a single book. Um, and he, he actually dedicated his first his book Dianetics, The Mental Science of Modern Health, as I like to think of it, is, was originally dedicated to Will Durant because that's where he'd learned all his philosophy from. You don't need to waste time getting a doctorate. Um, you just read this one book and you know everything you'll, you'll be able to then tell your followers all about Schopenhauer and Kant and Nietzsche, you know, from the pages of one book. Same thing is actually said about James Joyce, that he read one book about philosophy, but... He made great use of it to confuse people into thinking he was brilliant. You know, it's actually uh, he was brilliant though in his case, whereas uh, Ron Hubbard wasn't, and Charlie Manson wasn't. Manson himself says he didn't learn to read and write until he was twenty-seven in McNeil Island Penitentiary. This is not true, and it's one of the things we have to be careful of with such people, because believe it or not, they sometimes tell lies. Um, what is true is that Manson's um, reading skills were not very developed uh, until he started at McNeil Island studying Scientology and he wanted to read Scientology books and he did but there was something charismatic about him um, you know he was as I say he was a skinny guy he was five foot seven just under average height but I think that women found him attractive and that's a part of it too. You know, that's not something that Ron Hubbard could claim because he was ugly. What can I say? It's just unfortunate. It's just the way it was. And he can't, can't sue me. In, in many respects, it's, there's, there's a closer link to Tom Cruise, particularly with the height, the <laughs> attractiveness, the celebrity, the chasing of celebrity. Uh, that height thing, I, I, I return to it time and time again. Because you're six foot six, aren't you, Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> I'm six foot three. Six three. Oh, you're, you're a midget. I'm sorry, I had the right wrong idea. <laughs> yeah, well, just, it's a difficult thing to say because there's so many... Love so you're not a Randy Newman fan, you know? The, <laughs> the Toy Don't Story, the Toy Story singer. Where the, the man who wrote Don't Want No Short People Round Here and... Uh, oh, I don't know that song. I, 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 know, I just know him from Toy Story. Oh, well, oh, you should... Check check him out. Check him out. Uh, Harps and Angels. Buy a copy of Harps and Angels. Brilliant, brilliant songwriter. I think I've heard John Ronson talking a lot about Randy Newman. I think he, he's a huge Randy Newman fan, um, the journalist John Ronson. Who yeah, he did. I, I remember him doing something about it. I'm not keen on John Ronson because his, I think his first television interview was pandering to a Scientologist. So Was it? And sitting there ro rolling up his little cigarettes and saying, well, this Scientology looks like a really good thing, you know. He didn't. He did. He did. That's the first time I ever saw him. And then, then the men who stare at goats, the... I some of that material came from me. Did it? And I, I'm not acknowledged. Yeah, I I wrote a paper about the spoonbenders and their connection to Scientology uh, back 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 in the mists of the early 1990s. And I'm fairly convinced that he saw it along the way somewhere. So I'd like one pound fifty in royalties from from his work. Maybe two pounds. Well, John is a, John is a friend of the, of this channel, so I shan't join in your shenanigans. Uh, other John. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. And and do apologise to him fulsomely on my behalf. I shall indeed. I shall indeed. <laughs> but going back to my point about short people, I wonder if that's played... Who you like. Yes, I do like very much. Has that played a role? You've got Cruz, you've got Miss Cavage, you've got Manson. They're all people of diminutive Win stature. Winston, Winston Churchill, five foot three. He wasn't five three. He was. He was. Uh, he was, I promise you. And yeah, he's looking him up now. Adolf <laughs> Hitler, six inches taller than that, actually. Uh, five, six. 
Winston Churchill. F- I got five six here. Five six. Oh, sorry, I've taken three inches from him. <laughs> okay, I think I think that that can be a driving force. Any anything where somebody feels that they're being picked on or let's say belittled um, might drive them on. Um, Napoleon wasn't wasn't short though either. He was five foot seven. You would better check that as well. Um, David Miscavige, who hasn't really featured much in this conversation, what is he? Five foot four or something? Something like that. I, well, five seven, I would say, is quite short, but I think for the time it wasn't. No, at the time it was above average height. And uh, th- the last time I saw anything about averages, it was five foot eight. And that's been repeated to me throughout my life. So whether it's true or not. But no, Napoleon was, was a prince among men. Yeah. He just made the mistake of hiring very tall generals or marshals, as he called them. So in paintings where he's with the marshals, they're huge. And he's little bloke with... My tummy hurts with his hand on his tummy all the time. It's um, very sad. Five foot nine is the average height in the UK now in 2022, uh, which is 178.2 centimetres for those of a European persuasion um, or, 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 other, or otherwise, I suppose. Um, so, right. So we've got this sort of Tom Cruise like Manson guy. I mean, and then he's gone, he's done the, some Scientology stuff. He's recruited mostly women, but some men, they're all following him. Then how does it get to guys go out and do some murdering in the name of in the name of a race war? Wasn't it white people he was killing? Well, it, he was saying they would be killed, and from the accounts of his followers, he didn't use the N word. He said blackies, which is just as bad, frankly. Um, but he was not overtly racist. He did say they have been oppressed, they will rise up, and he believed that they would become his subjects one day. But when you look at the system he'd gone through, it had been, you know, there'd been Jim Crow and segregation throughout his life. Um, Prisons were segregated. Um, So he would have been kept away from from black people generally. Um, The... The, the tumble down happens because Tex Watson gets into a drug deal where he thinks he'll just take the money and run. And the uh, loads of popper, and that that's his the name he used, a man called Crow, um, who was apparently 300 pounds in weight, didn't like having his money taken. And he figured out where Tex Watson was and had taken some taken a woman hostage who'd been involved in Watson's little scam on him and was saying, I'm going to kill this woman if you don't bring me my money. And he called Charlie Manson on the phone. There was a phone at Spahn's movie ranch, which, by the way, is where Bonanza and things were, were filmed before the Manson family got there. I think Rawhide was probably there as well, you know, geez, Clint Eastwood's first. It's like in that Tarantino movie, isn't it? They, they sort of show that, the recent Tarantino movie. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, which, which I, it's funny, I was talking to Casey at the Colt Vault about this and um, she was, you know, how dare he change the end of the story? And I was kind of, you know, that's the thing I really like about the movie, that the murders don't happen. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, I've spoiled it now. <laughs> yeah, cut that bit out. Everyone's seen that that movie, haven't they? And uh, I think, or, or they're not going to. Yeah, everyone. And, well, he changes the end of Inglorious yeah. Bastards as well uh, to brilliant effect. Mm. Yeah. How dare he, you know, but... Bless Quentin, eh? Yeah, no, absolutely. So then they go out and start killing people. Well, what happens is that that they go to rescue this young woman who Manson says he doesn't actually know, and they go with a gun. And the guy who's got the gun chickens out, and Manson ends up shooting this guy in the chest. And he thinks he's killed him. And there are two witnesses who he leaves alive. So he thinks that, and the next day in the news, it says a Black Panther's been killed. And he thinks he's killed a Black Panther. And he knows that if you do that, you will get hurt. You know, they, they don't like it when you do that. So that starts, that's the process that begins the, the, the problem. Then there's another, they try and get some money out of a, of a, a guy who, there are different accounts of him. Um, Diane Lake, who knew him, says he was just this lovely man. And she doesn't believe that he was 
manufacturing synthetic mescaline, which is what other sources say. But he's told that the mescaline's no good and he's got to come up with some money. And Charlie Manson attacks him with a sword and cuts part of his ear off. And he's then actually held for some time by Bobby Beausoleil, Beausoleil, sorry, um, and and killed uh, in the end. Um, and the cops pick Beausoleil up. And so a plan is formulated, and it doesn't appear to have been Manson's plan. You know, this idea of the cult with this one person pulling the strings for everybody. The, the, the brainwashed zombie, no, don't, you don't meet them. There are people who are more or less under the control or the spell of the leader, but they will contribute their own stuff to it. So the family decide that the thing to do would be to go and commit some more murders and make it look as if the same person who killed Hinman, because there were words scrawled in blood at the Hinman, um, residents they will make it look like that so it can't have been bobby Beausoleil, and they'll let him out that's not what happened because in fact the murders weren't connected by the cops in fact the tape murders and the next night the um la bianca murders even they were not connected together by the cops until um a member of the family started talking in prison boasting about having been involved in these things which is how they caught him if she hadn't they might well have got away with it all uh, which wouldn't have been a good thing so he'd thought he was going to get a music contract with you know recording with the beach boys or, or recording for terry melcher he'd been turned down on that so all of the peace and love in him had drained away and he was now determined that his prophetic um, forewarning of Helter Skelter was about to come true. So what he added to the tape murders, and he did go into the house after they'd been committed. He wasn't there at the time. He wasn't there when Hinman was murdered, and he wasn't there when the Labiancas were murdered. But he was very much involved and admits that, that he was, you know, he took part in a conspiracy to commit murder. And so it was right that he should be in prison. It's strange that his autobiography says this. But he thought it was terribly unfair accusing him of having manipulated these people into the murders when they had participated willingly, when the idea had not come from him. Um, so, you know, a true cult where, you know, one of the aspects of cult, I, I sometimes, and it's rude of me, I, I call Scientology the bee org. Um, because they call themselves the Org, you know, the organization. And I call them the B Org because that's the Borg. And I'm not a Star Trek fan, but the Borg have one mind. All of the individuals, they're like an ant, you know, colony, termite colony. And I think the same becomes true within cult groups that people begin to act out what we might call the programming, the, the ideas, the doctrine, the dogma. And I think with the Manson family, they thoroughly got on board with the idea that Helter Skelter was coming. And the tape murders could be the beginning of that. So they tried to leave signs saying that, that black people had done this, which again, the cops didn't read. <laughs> you know, they didn't understand what they were. They even misspelt Helter, H E A L T E R, in Helter Skelter, you know, so yeah. literacy, you know literacy it's important and it all started really with a sci-fi writer who founded scientology l1 hubbard in a sense who knows what might have other otherwise happened has scientology publicly denied have they moved to cover up that manson had been a, a fervent member in a sense oh yeah yeah a few weeks ago um my friend steve hassan uh, phd let's add that um he wrote a he writes a column for psychology today and because um, the um, we were, Leslie Van Van Houten was about to be released, he wrote about the control issues and the extent to which we could consider her responsible for her actions or not. Um, you know, diminished responsibility, as it's called in law. And I think diminished responsibility is certainly an aspect of this case and the idea that this poor woman had been you know, apprehended, I think, in December 1969. And here we are, 50 whatever years later, and she's still in prison. That does seem, you know, rather draconian, but understandable given the, you know, the horrible 
nature of the killings. But because that had come up, Steve wrote his piece for Psychology Today, and he said, and Charles Manson had 150 hours of auditing. And let me point out that in my nine years, I didn't have that much. So this is a lot. Um, this is, you know, and so he put that in and immediately Psychology Today got a complaint saying, you know, and they sent them a copy of a newspaper article from The Guardian in 1971, which talked about somebody having withdrawn the libel that Charles Manson had been involved with Scientology. And this was proof. Psychology Today folded. The, the same day, I sent them the actual internal directive with the 150 hours in and said, you know, I'm an expert witness on Scientology, which means that what I say may be considered factual. You know, the High Court appointed me an expert witness in 1987. And when I wrote about it in 1990, they sued me for various things. In Well, they sued me actually for one thing in A Piece of Blue Sky. But they did not. No, actually, they did sue me for more because they sued me in New York before that. So they sued me for a bunch of things. Lovely people. But they never brought up the Manson allegation. And Psychology Today, I got, got this email back saying, we don't have time to look at books and chapters. And it's like, it's one piece of paper that I sent you <laughs> with my credentials, which are good. But so, yes, yeah, Scientology does not want people to know. And and. He didn't study Scientology in a Scientology organization. He, the, the guy who taught him had no um, right. You know, he wasn't a minister or whatever of Scientology. Um, and Scientology had nothing to do with the murders or the Manson family. But the dogma of Scientology had everything to do with, with these murders. And I think if we took that out of the equation, that the family would never have been formed. Um, the, because without these control techniques, he wouldn't have been able to lure these women in, many of whom were runaways, of course. You know, the, the kids in their teens who, who, you know, dropped out of a, a society that was a little difficult, who objected to the Vietnam War, you know, and um, wanted um, to, to create a paradise on Earth, you know, that kind of hippie longing that was... Uh, you know, part of part of the times, and they really. It sounds as if the family had a great time during the first year. You know, I'm not so keen on orgies personally. Never really wanted to do that. Um, but you know, different strokes for different folks. These people seem to have been happy. They seem to have been um, not dangerous or deleterious to the world until Manson ran out of money. And set them to stealing cars. And um, things kind of went, you know, lots of popper is shot and not in fact killed. He Manson, said that Manson was incredibly surprised when he walked into court to testify against him. So I thought you were dead. You know? um, but otherwise he kept the training routine zero stare going and the little X on his forehead, which he later transformed, of course, into a sticker to, to please people. But yeah, without Scientology, it wouldn't have happened. Sounds quite definitive. And it's quite amazing, really. And I think it shows why people like you and your amazing channel have to keep speaking out because psychology today were too scared to do so. You need to keep mentioning how dangerous this ideology can be. And they can find you on John A. Tech, Tech family and friends or friends. Of fa I always get the wrong way around. Fa fa family and friends. I think it is family and friends. Yeah. You don't even probably. know. Why would I know? I've done 420 videos and <laughs> I, I have no recollection of any it's, of them. I don't family. even know how many I've done. Right. Everybody go to John Atak Family and Friends. That's where you get the real scoop, the real down low, all the detail from John Atak. Further information about all of this stuff. Keep watching this channel as well. I'm going to put my first or one of my first episodes with John where he talks more about his background in Scientology up here. And I'm going to put something else related here i think and keep on watching hit the like as well but go to john you know all the stuff keep doing all the things and do the things